Well, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today, I'm just delighted to have- Am I, um, am I idea number 13? What's that? Or, oh, oh, am I idea number 13 or 007? <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome, Tom. It's your, your idea number 52, but I, you know, the, all, all the great ideas are always number one, you know, so it okay. depends. And there is, uh, there is this massive competition of all the ideas everybody has produced and they all jostle. So I have, it's called 52 living ideas, uh, one for every week, uh, because I think ideas are important and that we have to study uh, ideas. And we are, the idea that we are looking at um, in these three meetups, series of three meetups is idea of systems and how do you think in terms of systems? And I am honored to have Tom Gilb here, who has been a pioneer in systems engineering. Um, he's had an illustrious career since 1950s. He has been at it, uh, starting with IBM and then for a short, short time, few years, five years or so, and then on his own, uh, rest of the time, uh, applying ideas in systems engineering. Um, he is born and brought up in California, but moved to Norway. So he's speaking- Escaped, Tom. escaped. <laughs> Don't rub it in, you know. Uh, you know, he sent me a picture of this beautiful cabin uh, on the lake. Um, it, 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 what was it overlooking? Uh, uh, the Oslo Fjord. So it's a yes. fjord. It leads directly to the sea. Yes. We can, we can row a boat to New York. Wonderful. And some people have tried to do that. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm delighted to have him here. Um, so what I let me just jump into it. Um, one of the points that you make is that of engineering approach versus IT approach. So let me just step step back. What you know, I've been running these meetups for four and a half years. And what I found is that there are people who have the science base, kind of the science mindset, and there are people who have the humanities or arts mind, mind skin. They don't talk to each other much, okay? But I myself have the engineering minds, mindset, which I think is more powerful because it incorporates all of science and it is trying to transform the world. So it has kind of art, science, practicality all rolled uh, in uh, together. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but it's probably more powerful for certain classes of problems, but not necessarily for all classes of problems. Very good. So, so I would. So, for me, it's a great compliment to say that he's an engineer, okay, and he thinks like an engineer. So, um, you make the point about the engineering culture as opposed to IT culture. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What's the engineering culture? Okay. So uh, let's just square away what I call the IT culture. It's basically people who think about programming computers. And it's an oversimplification, but it's still very dominant. You know, I, I'm a programmer uh, and, and they, they even call themselves software engineers sometimes, but it doesn't mean they're an engineer of any kind. They're a coder programmer. Okay. What's an so engineer? They think, of, they think in terms of language, of instructing a computer what to do. What they do not do is think like an engineer. They don't think in terms of um, the um, uh, availability, reliability, security, or privacy of their system. That's what engineers do. So we can start by saying one characteristic of what we, I call engineering is that it thinks in multiple dimensions sim uh, simultaneously, or at least when addressing a problem. Okay, maybe one at a time, but. Uh, and they recognize they have to think in multiple dimensions of qualities and costs and values uh, to solve an interesting problem. And, and if they fail to remember some of these critical dimensions, I call them, then they probably will fail in the entire endeavor. Okay, so if you have 10 critical dimensions and you forget one, but a critical dimension can kill your entire project, then by definition, it doesn't help that you've done very well on the nine dimensions. The one dimension will kill your entire project. We've got almost every project that's ever had a problem uh, has been killed by a dimension. And you can see that that dimension was not taken due care of. So engineers are conscious, especially systems engineers, multiple dimensions. That's the first thing. The second thing that engineers do, and we sort of all know that, 
uh, is they uh, are able to think numerically about problems, putting numbers on the degrees of security, the degrees of user friendliness, the degrees of privacy, whereas programmers don't think in those terms at all. The notion of a degree of equality is outside the scope of what they do, uh, what their methods tell them to do and everything like that. Okay, so, the, the, so let me simplify this. Um, uh, engineers are working on what I call critical dimensions. That simply means all the dimensions you must consider to avoid failure and to succeed, okay? well, however many that is. And then the second thing they do is they treat these dimensions as variables and that allows them to put numbers on how much security do we need? You know, uh, what's the minimum privacy we need to put the system on the air? They think in terms of numbers. And that's what, uh, that's the first simple separation. I can say a lot more about it, but- oh, this, is, uh, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. So um, you were talking about, like for example, you talked about, um, you know, you're, you're a father, you're the father of the kind of agile approach to development. I sometimes and, back off a little bit and say grandfather. Grandfather, because, okay. <laughs> yeah, because the people who wrote the now very popular Agile Manifesto about 20 years ago exactly, uh, all uh, I consider them all my students. That is, they specifically point back to a book I wrote in 1988 called Principles of Software Engineering Management. And they say that's where we got a lot of the ideas about Agile. So, uh, so, uh, so popularly, they are the fathers of the current Agile movement. But since I fathered them, I'm the grandfather. <laughs> Wonderful. And you're, are you, it looks like you're, you're a proud, proud grandfather. I am indeed. Love, oh, lovely. Wonderful. Grandchildren are the best. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Um, so elaborating on that, what is Evo? Uh, tell me about how you came up with it for the first time? How did you think about it? What problems were you trying to solve in trying okay. to come up with this method? Okay, so uh, EVO will be a term unfamiliar to those who haven't studied my methods, uh, E-V-O, and it's really a concatenation of evolutionary. We all know that word, evolution, evolutionary. And uh, my, my uh, Hewlett Packard uh, did this uh, on my teachings on a very big scale throughout the corporation. And they're the ones who sort of for, forced us to, uh, you know, evolutionary is too damn many syllables. So evil was short in, in letters and, and uh, syllables. Okay, now, um, so what it, in very simple terms, it means we should do our projects, almost all of them, in, uh, step by step. And the steps should be small and the steps should produce some results or not. So it's very much like a scientific experiment or a, 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 or a vaccine experiment, right? You, you do small controlled steps. And if, it, if you have a problem, you stop, you analyze it, you try to find out what the root cause and you do something better and then another cycle and see if it works. So this is very much the scientific method. It's very much an engineering method it's very much a common sense method of how you should live your life and go through an educational process in life or anything else. But it's amazing how many institutions, uh, for example, governments and universities and large corporations do not understand this method. And they take uh, tremendously large investments like a healthcare system all at once, totally new, and without proving that it works even in the small, like in one town or one state, to take a simple example, that just the whole nation's gonna get the whole new system. And this is not just the US I'm referring to, by the way, we, we have this problem in Norway and, and Britain, not least. So uh, and now the thing is, if you, if you make too big a step at once for a large and complex system, history says it invariably fails. It invariably falls on it. I mean, history is so clear about this. Uh, it's, it's difficult to find any large complex system which in fact has succeeded straight off. Okay, historically difficult to find. Um, so, uh, and, and then common sense says, well, what's wrong with doing it a little piece at a time? Because the first advantage is you get some results early. Uh, in my world, that means next week. 
and I've done this on US Department of Defense systems. We're not talking about trivial small systems, okay? Literally done it on, on very large systems. And you, you, and you get some feedback next week. Does it work, does it not? And then using it, good feedback says scale up, do more, go from city to county to, to state to country and things like that. So uh, uh, what we're, uh, the EVO method is trying to generate a flow of values to stakeholders. In other words, results for people. Mm -hmm. And if it gets, it gets a little hiccup, you, you learn within the week or the month, but very, you know, not within five years that it isn't working, there's something wrong, let's uh, analyze it, let's find the root cause and let's try to cure the problem and let's move on from there. So EVO is quite simply that. And I think uh, built into many systems, including animals and biology, is a kind of uh, you know doing things. And I'm not talking about Darwin's evolution here as much as I'm talking about um, species trying to very carefully sense whether it's dangerous to venture out instead of just running out and getting eaten up by a wolf. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, so there's an awful lot of examples of uh, small steps with feedback is a very good idea and gigantic leaps are a very bad and unnecessary idea with almost no uh, uh, advantages and just downsides. Wonderful. That was the short. Wonderful. Version. So By I the way, uh, for those who, like Sanjay, want to go deeper, this book in chapter 10 has a chapter on Evo. So that would give you the thorough, deep explanation of what Evo is. But it's this is what is credited by most people as uh, a, a, a the root um, uh, of what is known as the Agile methods today. So I published as early as 1976 in my book, Software Metrics, a very clear description of this. And uh, uh, in my 88 book, uh, I mentioned Principles of Software Engineering Management, I published um, hundreds of pages of information about it. So I was the first one who dared to put it in writing while everybody around me was very enamored by what we now call the Big Bang Waterfall Method. You know, engineering, but doing it on a grand scale, which the U.S. Department of Defense was pushing very heavily at the time. Wonderful. So I was considered a bit crazy. <laughs> um, I want to make sure because there are many people here who are not familiar with software. So I want right. to make sure that they understand this concept clearly. And then I have one detailed question about the method. Um, so the basic idea is that you have a complete prototype kind of working system actually delivering values very soon. And then you, you kind of lock in those values, deliver those values, and then you do the next level, which delivers- Lock in if they are successfully delivered. If yes. there is a degree of failure in uh, values and costs, then you sit down and think about it. Yes. Feed, negative feedback causes us to stop, not lock in. Perfect. So I think that the kind of having a fast feedback loop and a yeah, constant feedback loop, which is what is actually provides a corrective mechanism for all the ideas, methods, the goals, methods, and actual implementation that you're putting together on a relentless cycles. And as you go on, it kind of perfects as you go on. Uh, does that capture it? Beautifully. Okay. Now there is one point that you make, which is very interesting. And that is about the cycle. Each cycle has to count for something. Like for example, it is important, the point that you make is that it is actually important to deliver value to the stakeholders, not just say that, oh, I did a new, new code. This new code was added. So talk a little bit about it of uh, in this cycle, the importance of actually delivering value so that each, each of the cycles actually is differentiated by delivering more value, uh, not yeah. by any kind of internal characteristics of it. Right. So the, the um, uh, current very popular agile that as software people are doing, in my, in my view, is a um, very bad idea. And uh, I've, I've written quite a lot about how bad an idea is, why it is. In, in free books, we can give you like a, a value agile, just to mention one. Now, uh, and why is it a bad idea? Because they've forgotten this idea of delivering value. They think that doing work like writing code and testing it and plugging it in the computer is what they're supposed to do. Okay, 
but but it's possible to deliver code and deliver no value. It's also possible to deliver value without delivering any code on an IT system. Okay, and they haven't got that clear in their minds. So they're very uh, focused on doing work, doing tasks, delivering functionality, delivering code, but they're not focused on what the main point of absolutely all projects is to deliver value to stakeholders, no exceptions known. Okay, and they haven't got the idea of a stakeholder. They're still very tied up in what they call users and customers as their focus. And then we realize that a stakeholder could be a, an international law about privacy, okay? And, 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 and they, they don't have that idea at all that you have to examine uh, maybe a broad array of stakeholders, find out what critical values they have, and you have to deal with them whether you like it or not, or they will fail you. This relates to two points that you made about the nature of engineers. One kind of multidimensionality, and second is the importance of measurement. Like you have to, unless you have- I've got to stop right away. You said measurement, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you go back, I hope I said quantification of variables. Now, measurement is one uh, piece of work you do on quantified variables, but quantification in itself without any measurement is very fruitful in communicating ideas clearly. So extremely secure is not as good as 42% secure. Excellent, excellent point, excellent point. Um, but the, I mean, the, one of the themes that I see in your work is to say, are you, do you have the, do you have the axis right? You know, are you measuring the right thing? I ah, think that's, yes. that's a theme that you keep coming back to. Yeah. Okay, now uh, in all phases of say medicine, uh, just think about the ideas of measuring the right things about COVID-19 and the struggle we are still having, okay? Mm -hmm. And management and engineering, uh, somebody is always making educated guesses about what counts, okay? And if they get it wrong and they persist in it, they'll fail, okay? If, uh, if they adjust very quickly uh, to the right things, then they will tend to survive and succeed and, and thrive, okay? So uh, in other words, uh, in, in general, people don't know the right thing, even though they may believe they do. But, uh, uh, so, but, but the, the, the trick is not to know the right thing, but to extremely quickly get feedback and adjust so that you tune into a more right thing. Yes. That's the best we can do with COVID-19 or anything else, okay? So, uh, but this requires quantification and it requires multidimensional thinking. Okay, if you don't if you don't have multidimensional thinking, you don't have quantification. What is there to adjust to? What is there to? How do you learn early that you have a failure on your hands? Beautiful, beautiful. All right, I want to change the topic. You said that you mentioned somewhere that you write five books each summer on knowledge, education, and engineering. Correct. Tell me about it. That's fascinating. Why? Why do you do that? <laughs> Well, historically, if we look back at my published works and time, we had a, a ten to th over 10 years between each book, starting about 1971. And, but then three years ago, I uh, sat down one summer and I decided uh, uh, to first, uh, well, write short books, uh, uh, short meanings between 100 and 300 pages. Okay, some of, I have books of 800 pages, by the way, mm -hmm. which took me four years to write. Mm -hmm. I decided to write shorter books and also to tune them into certain themes like education or uh, government or, or something like that. So, uh, whereas my earlier books are in, in actually more general, you know, okay. So, uh, now what I discovered was I could write a new book every two weeks. And that's, you know, it's, it's about Eight, eight hours hard work every day for two weeks, but that, that, that becomes a 100, 200 page book or something like that. A, at least a good draft of it that with today's technology, I can then digitally share it with anybody I want. Okay. And then, uh, so I, uh, uh, 2018, I did uh, five books. They're up on my website, guild.com. Uh, one of them is called Life Design. 
for example, which I think we're going to talk about later. How to, so it's not about IT, it's about how to design your personal professional life using engineering techniques and multidimensional thinking, right? And that was 2018. And then uh, we, so we put those up for, for sale. Uh, actually, we'd love to give them away for free if everybody read them. But my son said, if you, if you give them away, people won't appreciate it. Just put a price on them and then they pay money for it. They'll take it seriously. It's kind of silly. Uh, my answer is if people are so silly, I, I don't think they're worth having the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, so and last year I did five books. Uh, after I'd done four of them, I had a Polish friend of mine Pavel, uh, and uh, visiting me at the cabin. And I said, I'm going to do a fifth book. What do you, we've got any ideas? I'm sort of lost. Uh, and he said, look at the United Nations sustainability goals. And so I did, and I wrote a whole book on it, analyzing the goals and how badly formulated they are because they're fuzzy and they're going to, uh, we're going to delay ending poverty and hunger by about 50 years because the goals are so badly formulated by United Nations. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a free book. Anybody, you know, everything mm -hmm. I did last year is free. Okay. Uh, you uh, have, and you have uh, my permission. Yes. Uh, so tell, tell me what, what is the idea of publishing books for free? What, why do you do it? What is, what, what is in it for you? Why do you think this dissem dissemination of ideas fast is <laughs> valuable? Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, when I'm doing my research and I bump into a paywall from a big publisher with some academic, I get so angry, you, you know, that the, the knowledge is not simply free. You know, it's like the, a, a, against everything academia really stood for. Okay. And it, it's not the $10 to get the articles, the fact that they're going to charge me for knowledge that should be out there in the free. So I, I'm, I'm really, uh, and if anybody wants one of my paid books for free, because they're poor, just to ask, you can have it, right? So uh, I've always been one that even when I'm, you know, earning a living and uh, being a consultant or whatever, uh, I've always given away my articles, my slides. Uh, at the end of every talk, uh, decades ago, I would sit copying floppy disks for people, sometimes 10. So I've always been a sharer of knowledge and always appreciated sharing of knowledge back to me. I mean, I, I've, my whole life and education is from shared knowledge. Okay, so, you know, so Socrates isn't behind a paywall and didn't choose, charge me anything. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, okay. th that so, is, I, sorry, I, I'm an idealist. I believe that I have to, my, my mission in life is to spread the best ideas I have and uh, make them available for uh, the next generation, which will take them and hopefully make the world a better place, including the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Wonderful, wonderful. I, you know, that's very close to my heart as well. You know, I do these meetups on all kinds of topics. <laughs> and, uh, and what happens is that I think that the synergy that you create in the world by focusing together on great ideas produces a far more value than money that you can make from a book. Actually, you're kind of stopping most of the value of the book uh, from being realized if you do that. If even if you know you're losing, like if even if you can reach out, you know, if even if even if you lose half the people who would otherwise get the book, and you probably lose ninety percent of the people. So absolutely, I'm I'm all all with that with that, and I'm. Uh, very impressed that you can produce a book in two weeks, uh, and that's great. I think that's that's a normal. I think that's that's what everybody should be doing. You know, it's like <laughs> of being able to kind of write out. And the, the thing is that you have the advantage of working all your life and kind of honing your ideas, so you can now take it and apply it to anything. So I'm really, and it's kind of application of your Evo idea to transmission of ideas because I'm sure you get enough feedback. From, from other people and some good people who read it may be able to give you something that can, that can take your books to the next level. So I, I'm all for, for that. I'm definitely a strong believer in that. Go ahead. By the way, getting back is, is thrilling. And I have a large circle of professional friends who do give back, feed me, recommend books and things like that. So that's fantastic. But what I'm, that's not primarily why I'm doing it. Uh, I have an experience that one person can take my ideas 
and spread them in a larger environment like the whole of Intel. Yes. 20,000 engineers for the last 20 years. And that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, that man's name is Eric Simmons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he, he, he wrote one of the forewords to this book if you want to meet Eric oh. at an early stage. But the idea that one person can take my ideas and change a larger culture is uh, mind blowing. So, for example, if only uh, one person got a hold of one of my five books and changed the entire US government culture of planning, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what a fantastic result. Wonderful, wonderful. So, what I want to do now is I want to apply you know, the idea of systems engineering to a couple of different fields. Um, so we can either start with, so I've got three things in mind. One is personal life, second is education, and third is what you have to say about UN. And uh, so which one would you like to start with first? Doesn't matter, but- let's, Okay, let's, 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 let's keep UN for the end. Let's start okay. with personal life. How, how do you yeah. think, you know, people are aware of this in a business context, they are aware of it in terms of design of systems. How do you apply the same principles to making your life better? Right. Now, I have to uh, tell as short as I can, shaggy dog story. We don't have infinite time okay. here, but okay. I, I used to fly all over the world, you know, one, one new continent a week, and sometimes actually three continents in one week, mm -hmm. I think I was doing. And uh, you, you, uh, you sit down uh, uh, next to a stranger on the airplane, and you get into this, what do you do, what do you do? conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I soon learned that if I told them I was into uh, high tech IT, it, it would turn off the conversation. So uh, I, I just found another way of explaining who I was. I say, well, uh, I'm, I'm an architect. Mm -hmm. And I'm an author. And I solve problems. And, and at that point, it, uh, they were more willing to engage. So they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, uh, I can give a little demonstration. Uh, uh, if you'd like to plan something in your career or your life, we can do it sitting on this airplane flying, flying to Brazil uh, mm -hmm. right now. Uh, you know, we have a few hours and time to kill. So why don't you just tell me your objectives with your life? Mm -hmm. okay. And what I do, I then help them clarify their objectives, their, their critical objectives. And then I, I and as, when they're trying to give me their objectives, they usually plug in what I would call one of their strategies, mm -hmm. the means to their objective. I say, no, no, going to university, getting that degree is not your objective. Why do you want the degree? Why do you want to go to the university? And the answer to why, this is an extremely powerful question. Look up Japanese five whys. Mm -hmm. Why brings you to a higher level of concern. Let's say it brings you from thinking about the pragmatic things you have to do uh, and brings you up to the level of why you want to do them, what your objectives are. Anyway, I would do this on airplanes and people were so fascinated by it. I usually would meet them for dinners and, and uh, go to their homes and had have some really fun stories to tell, which I won't put in right now. But I discovered that people were very, very interested in planning their life a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for me, it was just a way of making sure the conversation didn't die out for the next 15 hours as you're flying to a new continent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wrote a book uh, over 20 years ago called Life Design. Uh, and I just would share it with friends. And I, I always said, I'm, 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 I don't want to publish it because I don't want to become rich and famous. Mm -hmm. Very un-American. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did share the methods with my friends above all. Okay. Now, uh, so three, in 2018, I decided, you know, it's time I wrote it properly, you know, a better, higher quality version. So at guild.com, you'll find the life design book. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. Anybody who writes to me a, an email and said, give me a free copy of your life design book, I'll give it to you. How's that? Forget the fact there's a little paywall at my, my uh, website. Uh, but uh, the, but the, the life design book is actually the same as this systems engineering book, because your life is a system <laughs> mm -hmm. and it needs to, it, we need to think about it more systematically than we often do. People get very stuck on that education or that job, you know, the finite thing they're gonna do. 
and they uh, or, or they get stuck in one dimension like making money or becoming famous or something silly like that. And the fact is we all have multiple dimensions that are important and critical for our lives. And we have to make our decisions about educations and jobs and hobbies and uh, getting married and everything like that. We have to make these decisions based on these critical factors, based on a balanced satisfaction of the critical factors. And that's systems engineering. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, why do you keep writing a book on education all the time? What's, what is education? What does it mean to you? And what do you have to say about how to approach, you know, how to use systems engineering approach to education? Okay. Um, now, uh, first, I t tell another short little story. For uh, over 20 years, I've held a one week private invitation only seminar in London called, we, today we call it the Guild Fest, but it's about uh, 35 people, uh, like the people sitting here, extremely well read, uh, deep not superficial and often a lot of, you know, decades of practical experience. And we get to get a whole little TED talk for each other and spend another half an hour after our little TED talk discussing. And we spent the whole week doing that. And that's been very successful, but we, I changed the theme every year. Uh, 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 and, and it turns out 2021, I changed the theme to education. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I wrote a book, which I call Ken, mm -hmm which I've sent you a link to and you can share with everybody, yes. mm -hmm. okay, uh, was I was sort of saying, well, hmm, I'll prepare my talk for the 2021 Guild Fest by writing a whole book on it. And so it forced, so I, I started looking up things like uh, educational planning in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, and I started looking at it and I found what I find everywhere that well-meaning good people who are like planning better educational systems for Britain um, they, they all have suffered from the same problem. Their, their primary objectives are at the bullshit level. Mm -hmm. They are fluffy and mm -hmm. nobody understands them properly or the same way. So I focused in my book analyzing why these plans couldn't work very well because nobody can possibly understand them. Okay, and I get very detailed about uh, you know, uh, analyzing sentence by sentence and word by word, why this is an unacceptable way of planning something as serious as our children's education. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've prepared myself, uh, basically uh, come uh, last week of June 2021, virtual or physical, depending on <laughs> my, uh, virus. Uh, I, I'm going to th throw my book on the desk, everybody, and say, basically, this is my preparation for the meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I did it in, in preparation, but of course, uh, uh, I'm very, very interested in education because I've, uh, all my life I've been a teacher and all my life I've been trying to educate people. And, and uh, so I get you know, more and more interested in the process of education. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, let me go to the next topic and then we will circle back. So you wanted to talk about what are the consequences when a big organization like the UN does not have their goals quantified or crisply defined. Um, please tell me what you okay. think. So uh, uh, anybody can look this up. You know, it's very public websites from the UN and other people. Uh, there, there's, um, there are some deadlines like there are from, for climate, you know, like 2030, we, we want to achieve, you know, uh, the 17 goals or something like that. But one of the goals is, is end hunger and, and another is end poverty, you know. Now that's all very nice, but if you start saying, well, wait a minute, what does it mean to end it? What is the, what is the definition of it's ended, right? And, uh, and, and, and by the way, what is poverty and what is hunger? Yeah, I mean, right at the top level, uh, there, there's, there's a, an awful lot of ambiguity and, and now, uh, and in a sense, they try to deal with it they, by getting more and more detail, but the more and more detail tends to also be ambiguous. So you have ambiguity supporting ambiguity. Now, long story short, my uh, estimation is that what they want to do by 2030, for example, will not be accomplished for another 50 years simply because everybody's running around confused about what the objectives are. 
They have no clear objectives to work towards. So everybody will, well-meaning, work towards ending whatever they think is poverty, whatever they think that means, you know, in this country and that country and, and this group of uh, world, uh, a whole health organization, but they, uh, they, they will not be focused on a clear agreed goal of any kind, okay? So in other words, we're gonna get delayed and we're gonna waste a lot of lives and money simply because the world has not got clear agreed objectives. Now, it doesn't mean there's one objective, but it, it does mean that what you're working on, you know, it, it could be want to end a certain class of, of disease in a certain country in Africa. That's very specific, but that uh, it needs to be very clear. You know, no polio in Nigeria uh, by 2022, you know, is, is a very clear idea, but just in ending disease in the world is not. And unfortunately, uh, as I've proven in detail in the book, which is free, sustainability planning, uh, it, it just isn't clear enough. And now the pro what it problem is that well-educated, well-intentioned people like the gang I'm talking to right now, they do not have the academic training to understand how unclear it is, how bad that is, and what to do about it. Uh, you know? Let's, let, let's uh, try to concretize it. Um, so let's take hunger. Yeah. How is it that they talk about it and how do you think we should talk about it. We should talk about it. Okay. Now, uh, so let's, let's start with the simple uh, end hunger, right? Okay. Now, uh, the, um, uh, okay. So, um, the, the, again, the, every word is ambiguous. So end, what does an end mean? For example, if, if we end it for one day and then it comes back again, like the virus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have we ended? Have we ended it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we ended it. Yeah, but it came back. Okay, mm -hmm. so I mean, a simple thing like the word "end" is not well defined. It, you know, if you if you look around at all the all the massive literature, it's not clearly defined. Okay, and there are a lot. Uh, I've got six academics I put in the back of the book who recognize the problem and they're working on it. Uh, I'm not very amused by what they've done, but at least they've clearly recognized the same problem and clearly tried to work on it, okay? Now, uh, and, and so take the word hunger. Is hunger the feeling, uh, gee, I, you know, I wish I had a hamburger, or, or, or is it, you know, next step is, is starvation? You know, what, what is hunger? And again, you find the same problem. You look around for a good definition of it, and it's not there. And there's all kinds of attempts to say something about it, very wordy. All over the place uh, and to, to break it down but th these attempts themselves are full of ambiguity and lack of clarity it's, it's very difficult to find anything which is clear that people can agree on for, uh, you know if we're going to work together as a world team uh, we have to have uh, agreed on something which is the same thing and if you have these nice sounding now by the way words like end hunger and poverty have their virtue Let's call it at a political rallying cry. Let's end hunger. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as they, at some level, are well defined for the people who are going to do the food programs and the medical programs and things like that, right? Excellent. So there's there, uh, the the point is we're we're so used to these political uh, statements, and and uh, by the way, the politicians have learned for God's sake don't say anything clear or they'll hold you to account if you're elected. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. So let me circle back to the core idea of systems engineering. Um, what you've been talking about is that you've been talking about having the virtue of having clear goals, quantifying things, having rapid feedback loops uh, to test everything and you know, all these, these meetups, we focus on people in general, you know, intelligent people, curious people trying to learn. They come from all kinds of different backgrounds. So let me ask a general question. What can a layman, what can anybody who is determined to improve their life or improve whatever systems that they're dealing with, what can they learn from the practice of systems engineering? Okay. Now, again, we, we know that good engineers and scientists are forever quantifying mm -hmm. and measuring, okay? 
So uh, it would be revolutionary if our culture changed or your culture changed so that critical variables like hunger, health, okay, uh, were uh, always quantified, no exceptions. So I have a theory that all stakeholder values and all human values without any exceptions can be quantified. By the way, if you Google Tom Guild TEDx, you'll find my talk on quantifying love. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Not joking at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, I must tell the short version of that story. Please. Um, I, I, I was uh, holding a lecture in London for a man. He's, uh, his name is uh, uh, Mr. Day. He, he was uh, uh, at Boeing, and uh, but he had a very a hobby of being very Christian. He was actually a the, the president of the American Christian Fellowship Association, and he's left Boeing and he, he does religion. Anyway, he, he uh, surprised me. He said one day, I've got my PhD in divinity, and not many of my IT friends have done that. Okay, Lawrence Day, his name is. Anyway, I, I, so I started uh, explaining how I taught some engineers in Holland as a challenge from them to quantify love. And he got so angry at me, he walked out of the room in London, went back to Seattle, and didn't talk to me for six weeks. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is as, as if I had drawn Mohammed and he decided to mm -hmm. execute. Mm -hmm. He was so angry. He said, love is a central Christian tenet. God is love, etc., etc." And there's nothing in the Bible about quantifying love. And, you know, you're, you're, you're just uh, crazy. Six weeks later, he wrote me an email, which I still have, and I've just communicated with him this week. We're still good friends. And he said, humble apologies, Tom. In Corinthians 13.1, I think it is, <clears throat> the, uh, the Bible uh, um, teaches people to uh, de uh, define agape, the Greek word for love, and it does it exactly through the method that I was teaching, which is to decompose it, Cartesian decomposition, into where the for, uh, you know into things like um, um, you know being faithful and being honest and things like that. And and he said uh, it, the word of the, the word of God is exactly what the method that you were teaching of decomposition, so that it becomes easier to quantify by decomposing the you know ten or twelve things there. So uh, he then went on to do, a, uh, as part of his doctoral thesis, we've got a copy of it and can share it, uh, how to quantify love. Wow. Wow. That's quite a transformation. Um, excellent. So what I want to do is I want to now let uh, the audience ask questions. Um, so folks, uh, we have four rules. Number one, in order to ask questions, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, feel free to disagree with anything that anybody says and do so courteously. Uh, next one, uh, the first one I see is John. John, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. This is great. Uh, I must confess, uh, my title is software engineer. So I don't know, maybe I should, maybe I need to go change my title after that. <laughs> Although, I think titles in software and development these days are so like they change every day. And so it's, they're almost like meaningless now. Um, so, uh, so I agree with a lot of, a lot of what you said. Um, so my question is about, there's sort of a paradox for me because I feel like, right. At any given time, let's say as a human being, I'm a part of multiple systems, maybe an infinite number of systems. Right. And I only have a capacity to be, adept at operating in some of those systems. I may by happenstance be doing okay in systems, but not through no like conscious effort of my own, right? But at certain times I will need, I may, I will be affected by, and I may need to work within or take actions in systems I'm not familiar with, or I may need to quickly figure it out, or I may need to plan for that contingency. And so my question is, how do I, as a, uh, an agent in a system who's, who's let's say adept at operating in system A, but a novice in system B, go about taking to account, like knowing what I need to, knowing what the factors are so that the critical factor that may be risen by system B does not sink me. 
does not cause me to fail. Uh, this is sort of a paradox because, you know, I can imagine off the top of my head, there's several, several ways I could go and like go to college and like, you know, learn how to be an expert in system B, but I probably don't have the time to do that. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. If you could help, help me with okay. that. Conundrum. Good question. By, by the way, I've written a lot about complexity and simplification, and I can uh, make those things available. And most of the free books in their references have these references, by the way, look for, uh, but okay, so here, uh, I, I have this problem all the time because I wander in an uh, enormous variety of spheres of, of different types of businesses and public uh, uh, government things. And so I'm forever confronted with it. So I'll tell you my first advice. You uh, ask the following questions about it. What is the most critical thing to get right in that, that new thing? Uh, system B, you were calling it, right? And people will tell you, like, uh, you know, uh, that you don't turn off the trade unions <laughs> or something like that, okay? And you, so you, you tick one, say, is there anything else which is critical, which could kill the whole system or disturb it? Yeah, uh, it, it's um, ma making sure that uh, young children can interface with it. Okay, number two. So you can, what you do is you ask a series of questions about what are the top 10 will we'll do, do a lot of good, most critical factors. And, and you ask people who are domain experts who know that domain, what are the, what you're doing, you're outside the famous black box. Don't make the mistake of going inside the black box and trying to understand everything there. You don't have the time. And by the way, it won't, you won't necessarily get the same insight you'll get as if you're looking at the top 10 characteristics outside the black box. By the way, I don't know if you can see this uh, it's my book. Yeah, it's like a four-dimensional Rubik's Cube. That's sort of like a, a Rubik's Cube, but it's, it's sort of like a box. And, and those arrows are the, you know, the little peepholes for understanding very complex systems with billions of combinations and parts, like computer programs, one of the most complex things in the planet in addition to our brain, right? And, uh, but, but by uh, uh, look, looking at the uh, critical qualities and values outside of any system will give you same day insight, which may be more than most people dealing with the system actually understand because they haven't ever asked those questions. You may become more usefully expert than them by asking those questions because they don't. They're so involved with the innards of it, you know? Excellent. Okay, uh, so th that's my first advice. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mikey, Rich, Donna, and Deborah. Mike, Mikey, go ahead. Okay, I'm really impressed with what you've shown so far. I can see how to design a car or an airplane or even a software system. I don't exactly know how to approach, uh, there's several things I don't know. How to approach world hunger, which was... Uh, mentioned. I don't know how to estimate cost and time for the objectives. And of all the system design methodology uh, tools that are out there, uh, how to select the right tool to, uh, uh, to do this estimation. Can you give me some words of insight in those things? Yeah. Okay. Again, I have to uh, be brief. Um, let's see the uh, first one Okay, so uh, take, okay. Now, number one, uh, uh, if you read my book, uh, 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 Sustainability Planning, or even scan it, you will get a pretty clear picture of how to quantify and uh, deal with hunger. That's, that's the, the simple answer. Okay, now, uh, but l let me teach you all uh, instant quantification of soft values, right? Uh, Mikey, give me uh, one val value uh, uh, that is critical for any system you're interested in. Just na name it. Give me a word. I want to finish this thing by uh, the end of calendar year 2021. Okay. You, well, you gave me a deadline. Uh, that's okay. We can deal with that. And that was my okay. second question. Uh, it's a value like a quality, things that people, it's like hunger, but it's not necessarily hunger. This, but, but throw me something you think is difficult to quantify and pin down. That's what I want. Um, a 
Okay. Uh, what do I want to do? I, uh, okay. Uh, 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 class C institutional food uh, to provide that at, uh, to everybody. Not necessarily okay. gourmet food, but class C institutional food. Okay. Now you've given me what I would call a strategy. So I'm going to ask you my why question. Uh, okay. Why, why would you want to provide that food? Because, uh, why? Because uh, life sustenance without necessarily luxury. Okay. So uh, can I, can I call it nutrition just to, without changing your, what you were tending to do? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so, so there, there's a value there somewhere, and let's call it nutrition until we find a better word. Uh, okay, so notice what you did. You did exactly what I predicted. You gave me a strategy when I was asking for a value, okay? And that strategy is nobody's value, but nutrition we recognize as being a value for people. And we can even say, why nutrition? And it has to do with health and life and things like that. Now, how do you quantify nutrition? Well, actually, that's the subject most of us know a lot about. Okay, uh, I was brought up with it, as it turns out. I had a fanatical mother who knew every vitamin and, and what they did and things like that. But uh, now, but it, it, I, I'll, what I suggest you do is if you, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to bring up my Chrome, I'm going to write nutrition on a browser. Nutrition. And I'm going to then write metrics. In other words, write the variable or the value and then write the word metrics after it. And I get 160 million hits or results. And now my point, my point is, uh, the big problem people have is said, you know, I'd like to quantify it, but it's soft. You know, I never, nobody ever, uh, people taught me to quantify a lot of stuff like weight and uh, uh, distance and time and money, but they never taught me to quantify nutrition, okay? Uh, so, uh, so here's the, a fantastic trick. If you want to quantify something because you want to clarify it, you want to talk about it intelligently, and you put that keyword plus the word metrics in a browser, you will get 160 million people telling you how to do it. And, and so you cannot be in denial like this is soft. It cannot be quantified because people have that problem. Now you've, got it, you've broken through the glass roof of denial where people say it cannot be quantified like money or how do you turn to money or something silly like that. So uh, yeah, so that, that's my advice is uh, uh, if it's really critical, other people have dealt with it and they have published that they have dealt with it quantitatively like good engineers, managers or scientists. Wonderful, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, that's next only time. number one. Uh, I, I, I know I, I remember his other two questions, but maybe you feel we should move on. Anyway. Yeah, we should we should come back. We should cycle back okay. uh, because there is Rich, Donna, Deborah, John, Jairo waiting. Sure. So everybody gets it. Everybody my, gets my, one my, question. Mikey, if, Mikey, if you email me, I will answer your other two questions about costs and comparison of methods. Okay. Tomagilb.com. Um, wonderful. Uh, so, Rich, uh, thanks for thanks for uh, addressing it, enlightening me. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Okay, thank you uh, to take the call. Tom, thank you for hosting this seminar, really helpful. And uh, I, I, there's a lot I can learn from system engineering from you and your organization, but I want more philosophical questions, maybe the boundary of system engineering. So what do you think the limitations, what they cannot solve? Okay, now uh, we can start with small and simple systems like you know, uh, uh, I want to take a day trip with my kids on Wednesday, by, you know, on, on the weekend. Uh, we don't need systems engineering for that. We can make perfectly good. In other words, the, the smaller and simpler the system is, the less we need engineering and, and the less we need system engineering. In, intuition will get pretty good answers. And, and if you, you screw up the coming weekend, maybe you'll do better on the next weekend. You'll still get some feedback from the kids, okay? So, uh, okay, so when, when, does, when does engineering and when does system engineering come in? And, and the simple answer is uh, the larger and more complex it is, the more it needs engineering and the more it needs systems engineering, okay? Now, it turns out we have a, a huge quantity of very large, very complex systems, like a national health system or a defense system or a large organizational uh, system. Uh, so we're uh, we're constantly confronted with these huge systems, and people haven't learned to deal with them. P 
people are using primitive uh, log cabin building methods, but they're dealing with a 400 story skyscraper. Okay. So in other words, there's, there's a point, is, is a tipping point in scale of both volume and complexity and size, where if you do not use engineering and you do not use system engineering, you will fail. Is that have you have you have you thought about like say complex uh, uh, problems, but system engineering cannot solve it? Do you have uh, running into those kind of problems? Okay, uh, very. Which good which question. I mean is kind of off topic. I know you have yeah. a lot to teach in system engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not yeah. important, a low priority question, but just from from a complete complete no, point a, of view, how you have question. those? I yeah. Almost yeah. like to challenge yeah. myself to write a paper on. Uh, yeah. questions the systems engineering cannot solve. <laughs> and I frankly, I haven't thought too much about it. Uh, I, I, uh, I like to think everything can be solved, but I'm actually, I, I agree with your implication. There is a class, for example, here, um, merging people's religious and political beliefs so there's no more strife anymore. Now, at best, if history is any guide, another few thousand years might be required if we can solve it at all. There's no simple solutions like form the United Nations or something like that, obviously. Okay. So, so let me say, in other words, uh, let's call these uh, mega problems. You know, they're beyond, uh, uh, what, uh, beyond any, any method we have today, and nobody has really solved them. Okay? Uh, thank so, you. Yeah, I'm sure there are questions like that. But, but what would be fun is to say, uh, assuming there is a class of problems like that, and I think uh, religious, political, um, uh, lack of strife would, would be a class like that, then it would be very interesting to think about what would the methods be that we have to use. And I don't think systems engineering is one of them. I, I think we have something like, I don't know, inspirational cultural change. We, we need another, you know, re, uh, religious political leader to uh, a Dalai Lama or somebody like that to, to lead us all into uh, a, a healthy path. That, that's the solution. If history is any guide. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, um, Tom. Uh, next up is Donna, Deborah, John, and Hiro. Donna, go ahead. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Tom. This is fabulous. Um, thank you, Donna. I, my background is software development, and then I transitioned to user experience. So I would love your opinion from a software developer. Uh, I love Agile. I think it's excellent, but from a user experience perspective, the, the challenge I face is that you need to, I, I need to, to design effectively. I've got to look at the whole big picture and, you know, design from that perspective because if you design from the small piece, then the experience is very, um, you know, it would be very choppy. So uh, I'd love your input into how to combine user experience with the software development, with agile software development. Okay. Uh, Donna, if, if you email me and ask for my uh, user experience slides, I'll send them to you. I, I have a lot of friends in the business and, and uh, have held talks at their conferences, and so this would be tailored to your level of interest. But let me, let me um, have one big idea and, and, and one summary. The key word here is stakeholders. And in the Agile community, they generally do not recognize stakeholders at all. Uh, they keep on talking about users, as in user experience, and customers. And the problem is they're only a very small fraction of all the stakeholders. So if you want to do systems engineering and get the big picture of everything that counts, you have to do stakeholder analysis. That means 50 to 500 types of stakeholders have to be analyzed. And analysis means what are their critical values? When will they kill you off if they don't get what they want? Okay, that's where you find you, the sources of your values are the stakeholders and their subjective opinion about what they want if they're going to play ball with you. Okay, so, uh, and I suggested to my UX 
UA friends, they should stop using the U and start using the S. In other words, stakeholder experience. And, and, and so that's my primary suggestion. Delete the U, go for stakeholder, get the broader picture and design for stakeholders. Deborah, you're next. Hey, that fits perfectly into what I want to talk about, Tom, or actually um, get your feedback on. And that is, I'm a public school teacher. I teach fourth grade, which is nine year olds. And uh, the problem that I've encountered is the systems that are that people are trying to get me to use, which are really stupid. And <laughs> so <laughs> let's just be real here. Um, so kind of like textbook designs that are just really bad or um, some sort of paradigm that someone else created. So I'm um, pretty confident. So I just it, reject all of that stuff. And um, I have a number of objectives. So I, I was writing them down as you were speaking. And then I have a solution, which is designing my own lessons and engaging ways to learn. So I wanted to get your opinion on that because so many people are afraid. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid I'm going to get in trouble. And I always tell them, stop worrying about that. Do what is right and what your students need. So I was curious about your opinion. Okay. Now, by the way, I, I just uh, encountered a man I'd like to reference uh, and I've started reading his book and so you'll perhaps be very I think uh, from memory his name is uh, Michael Strong and he's written a book called Be the Solution mm. which is from 2010 so just uh, make a note of that I, I just got a Kindle copy and started reading it last night and I got my first email back from him today just before oh, wow. this Started. Yeah, so he's alive and well. Now, uh, long story short, you'll, you'll, you will know about Montessori schools, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. That's kind so of what I do, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I wonder how you could get away with this and not get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I've been sitting in principal's offices a few times. <laughs> no, well, he did. Do, he went through all of this, but he, he, he's, he, uh, he's, he's campaigning for essentially changing the whole school systems so that people are free to design stuff that works. And they're not today in so many instances. So uh, you'll find, a, let's just say you'll find a lot of inspiration from, uh, uh, there are videos, which uh, if you write me, I'll give you the link to his one hour video I just heard. Uh, that very, that's where I got a hold of him. And uh, his book is there for $18 or something, Kindle. Uh, but he's, he spent his whole life campaigning to, um, make the school teacher and teaching system freer to satisfy the capability and potentiality of the students. So, you know, you, you, and, you and he'd be good friends, but it's a fight and it's an uphill fight. Yes, and it's, one it's a good fight. It, this, this is one of those uh, problems that will not be solved in your, my or your lifetime in most countries. You know, you're, it's, you know, he, he talks about a thing called, uh, it's called educational grammars. You know, like there is a 12th grade, there is an English subject. And he says, we've got to get rid of these grammars. They're standing in the way of actually en enlightening people and helping them become the creative individuals that society needs. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, Tom, uh, next up is going to be John R. Hiro, Lester, and Jeff. John, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, this is an amazing uh, conversation. And it's so seldom that issues get raised on this level with this kind of insight. So, so I'm very pleased that, that this is occurring. And, uh, and this, we could have extended conversations of all kinds, but I'm just quickly um, of initiatives that you know are happening around the world right now at, at any scale, uh, exploratory or underway. Uh, could you give an example of, of one or two things where you think uh, it's going well and it's being done in the right way? Ah, going well in the right way. Let's see, defense, no. There are very interesting things happening in defense thinking. 
uh, I, I, I did a, a lecture which I can make available to everybody. It's ca I called it Managility, Management Agility. Okay, and if somebody reminds me, I'll make the slides available. Uh, that that uh, there's a a big serious move in the defense department uh, in the direction of uh, avoiding the the uh, big bang projects and getting to incredibly small decentralized systems so that you can resp uh, respond. Okay, so I, I would say they're they're headed in the right direction. There's a guy called Steve Blank. And I give you his uh, uh, Steve Blank, S T E V E B L A N K dot com. He's amazing, but he is uh, helping to organize the uh, uh, Defense Department to uh, be far more agile, put it mildly. And uh, uh, this is a major, major, major pivot for U.S. Department of Defense. But it's it's, it's also going to be a several decades long struggle if, if we don't get you know defeated uh, first. To, so, so I would identify that as it's, it's, it's late, it's like 10 or 20 years too late, but it's, uh, it, the Third World War hasn't started yet. And so uh, there, you know, there, there may be some hope there. So I would say that's on the right track, but it's still, uh, so I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, let's see. Um, uh, well, what's I'm, significant I'm, here is that if one, if one or two of these start working and, then, and they start working well, then they become examples and other and, and it spreads other people pick up on it and it starts to happen elsewhere agreed agreed now by the way steve blank started his uh, uh, career he's by the way professor at stanford just to give a rough idea but he's also freelanced and but uh he started he actually co-invented a thing called lean startup which is very popular uh, among startups right so he co-invented that so this idea of agile and rapid change and everything uh, is old stuff for him what what he's doing is helping the Department of Defense move from the dinosauric colossus of wasting taxpayers' money on projects that don't work and are no good for the next war. Okay, and 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 he's he's working very actively to train the young young people and get young enthusiastic generals and admirals and people in in the Defense Department to really pivot and change towards more agile, decentralized uh, systems. So he's, I, I, I'll give you one really good example. I, I, I like that and I hope he succeeds and sets an example for other defense departments and in fact, other government departments at the same time, okay? But maybe given time and, and because I also have problems thinking of other good things, if I think of education and, med and medical systems, uh, I'm, I'm almost at a loss to point out similar uh, uh, change mechanisms so that's well, really and just quickly you know without extending things too we i'll mention this we let's not follow through on it let's give other people an opportunity but um uh, there's another uh, uh some other really important thinkers and and uh i'm i'm bad with names on the on the top of my head but uh there's a new book a new initiative that you can google that's that's called um humanocracy Okay. Uh, and and I know the people who are involved with this. The term is humanocracy, and the book has just come out. And and they give examples of of decentralized organizations and decentralized efforts that I think are in a business sense uh, at, that that are doing things well. And particularly, they mention a Chinese, a large Czech, a Chinese appliance firm actually named Hayer, and the way they're implementing uh, decentralization and problem solving and avoiding bureaucracy and working with fast responsiveness uh, is quite impressive. And I had not, and, and, and so not only is it being done at, it's being done at scale, but it's being done in a manner that is economical and profitable and very responsive. So, so I, I think that there are some really great examples of this out in the, out of the wild. Oh, uh, Gary Hamill, one of the authors. And yes, quite yes. Business, business circles. Right, yes. I just looked it up. I'll probably buy it and read it. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. <laughs> uh, next up is Jairo. Jairo, you can ask one question. Go ahead. So what do you think about the open source community versus like closed sources? Like, uh, yeah, like say Linux versus Windows uh yep. mac thanks and their apps like 
is one are the other more systems uh, thinking oriented and, and more serving the, the user or maybe the stakeholders? Okay. Now, you know, my heart goes to open source. That's why a lot of my books are just Creative Commons, free forever. Uh, and, and that's my little open source contribution. So we're all for that in principle. We should, that's a sharing of knowledge. However, for certain purposes, it's clear that um, uh, you, you will need systems which are not open source, which are very, very closed and secret and uh, tailored. And that might be the best decision to make for a given systems problem. So it's not one, uh, one is not superior to the other. They're, they're good for different purposes and different objectives. Thank you. Uh, next up is Lester, Jeff, and Jean. Lester, go ahead. Um, you mentioned a healthcare system and the defense uh, systems. And I, it's, it's possible that those are all working perfectly well designed as they're meant to be from certain people's point of view, that a lot of money gets transferred into certain hands. I mean, for example, even the Defense Department, you can't actually find out how much we spend because they hide the money in all sorts of ways. <laughs> but that leads into the concept I'm sure you're familiar with of wicked problems. Basically, they're problems that where systems engineering is kind of utterly fails because you can't define the uh, the objective function that people are trying to optimize. So wh wh what's the next step beyond systems engineering for really hard problems like that? Okay, um, let's see if I can pull this off. Uh, type message here to everyone in meeting. And I have a, do a, a set of Okay, so th there's a link to, um, it's called wicked problems are perhaps simple. And that's my short answer. <laughs> uh, I, I believe there are certain uh, uh, paradigms, I call them principles, for dealing with wicked problems. And these are not necessarily what systems engineers would call systems engineering, but there may be elements of it. Uh, for example, uh, looking outside the black box at critical factors is certainly a good way of dealing with wicked problems. Um, one thing I've done in, in the wicked problems paper uh, and there, uh, is I've analyzed the academic literature and found it is not very well thought out and uh, counter argued against the, the academic understanding of wicked problems that they've, they've got it all wrong. And so, so that's my short answer is look at that and I have a few more sets of slides and papers on it. Um, yeah, it, it's to start. We're giving short answers and and uh, yes. a few of people here. Exactly, and we yeah, and there is a lot of things to follow up on on the website. So please uh, do go to the website. All this information is there. Uh, next up is Jeff, Sanjay, and Jean. Jeff, go ahead. So Tom, this yeah. is just um, this is terrific. Thank you so much for Thank all the much. work that you've done <laughs> and the energy and perseverance you bring to it. I wanted to give you one little example of um, a successful approach to uh, experience with your kind of approach. I um, co-created and ran an endeavor for about a decade that focused on money uh, and, and, and allowing people to experiment, um, which is uh, some often sort of the unaskable question, you know? And um, so what we did was very simply, we gave unrestricted $200,000 grants to arguably a thousand of the very best nonprofits in the United States um, on the basis of who they, they'd done, not their specific programs, not tight budgets, none of all that, you know, and said, you all are great leaders. You've accomplished great things. Use the money for whatever you want. Tell us what you spent it on, uh, you know, why, um, with whom, what you achieved, what you learned, and what might be helpful to anybody else. It generated the most remarkable results. It was the largest unrestricted grant program in the history of philanthropy in the United States. And um, it's still going on. And um, that level of creativity that was funded and incented and um, uh, it really demanded 
of people who were already leaders in all kinds of different fields addressing all kinds of wicked problems was an experiment that is now being used by philanthropy to sort of move forward and consider it. And you know what the one thing that all those funders did when, when the pandemic hit? They turned their program grants into uh, unrestricted grants because they knew that was what we required to deal with the situation. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. Please, you're gonna give us some links to follow up so I can read about this, please. Sure. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and put the links in the uh, in the in the chat, please. Thank you. Okay. Jeff. Uh, next up is uh, Sanjay. So uh, just I, I just wanted to say Jeff has been a regular at our New York meetups for about a couple of years now. Uh, so it's wonderful to have have him here. Uh, next up is Sanjay. Sanjay, go ahead. Um, thanks. So um, I wanted to just um, touch on something that um, uh, a few people asked and um, so I want to present it as, as uh, something that I think um, Tom should be able to comment on. I um, suspect he'll agree with what, what I'm going to present. So um, the wicked, difficult problems um, are out there. And one way to look at it is we have, we have physical problems, which most people are aware of, and, and systems engineering is, is pretty adept at doing, handling those. And then we have what I guess we can classify as metaphysical problems. So systems engineering actually can also be applied to those. Um, but... I'm not sure also whether we can apply them to 100% of those. And here's, here's a way, um, you know, Tom's described um, the use of variables um, and, and uh, quantifying variables. Um, but one thing that a lot of people may not realize is that when he talks about variables, he's not talking only about scalar value variables, right? He's talking also about multidimensional variables, for example, matrices or vectors. And once you understand the power of, you know, the mathematics becomes very simple when you deal with it from a point of view of matrices. And many areas of engineering deal with engineering and, and sciences deal with um, problem space as uh, multidimensional matrices. So for those of you who understand what that means, um, you may understand that the problem space expands tremendously um, in what you can solve. Uh, agreed. By the way, uh, there's a subject I didn't get to and may not get to it. I'll put a name on it. Uh, I call it uh, impact estimation tables. Now the word table says uh, matrix basically and multidimensional thinking. It's, it's in my competitive engineering book, but it's a way of evaluating uh, very many different solutions against very many different values. And it's a way of uh, handling the multidimensional problem which people haven't learned to do at all. Uh, there are tables, there, there are things like quality function deployment and balanced scorecards, but they fail to quantify usually. They, they use uh, silly little notations like five stars or uh, good, uh, good security uh, rather than defining it. The moment you combine multiple dimensions and quantification and tables, you get a lot of power in understanding wicked problems. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, last question is from Jean. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, takeaways first, and then we will do breakout rooms if people are interested. Uh, so Jean, uh, just one question, very brief, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tom. Really exciting topic and gave me a lot of hope. My question actually is, uh, I read this book called Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game, I think it's told, mentioned a lot of things behind. I think system is really a solution for a lot of things. But I think the deeper question is when people have no skin in the game, people are actually doing, that's why our government is so inefficient, not because we, they don't know how to figure out the system, because they have no skin in the game. So there's no right. incentive for them to solve the problem. I think that's deeper problem behind the system, you know, the motivation or the incentive. I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with you very much. I sometimes use the phrase motivation is everything. And the reason for a lot of problems is exactly what you point out, people are not motivated, okay? So now uh, uh, in, in my competitive engineering book, I actually am describing a language I invented. It's sort of my life's work. It's called language, planning language, right? And th that includes this quantification of all the factors. It also includes all the ec economic or resources, and it also includes these multidimensional tables and Evo and everything. But uh, long story short, part of that language is to assign responsibility 
at a fair, like uh, for one objective of 10, assign responsibility to somebody to edit it, assign responsibility to somebody to deliver it, assign responsibility to a supplier uh, for it, etc. So I, uh, I uh, have a very large number of ways of assigning responsibility. Hopefully we offer the responsibility and it's accepted or not, but this is one tactic for creating practical motivation at a, a fairly finite level. Otherwise you have what my stepfather used to call Mr. Nobody is responsible. Wonderful. I agree, in the game, good point. Excellent, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Gene. Um, okay, folks, so now we're going to go to takeaways. Uh, and the way we're going to uh, do the takeaways is um, anybody who wants to give a takeaway. So the question is, what are you walking away with from this meetup? What did you learn? Uh, you can go ahead and, uh, you know what? I can just call on people. It's not that many people. Give me just a second. Hold on, I'm just gonna change the view here so I can see everybody. All right, so let's start with uh, Francoise, um, Akovi, and John. Francoise, go ahead. Well, um, it's mind boggling, <laughs> you know, because I'm so novice in the matter that I have to digest it and, and see where it takes me. But uh, thank you for opening that door. Thank you, Francoise. Thank you. Next one is Akavi, uh, John, and Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I like, the, I like the talk. But I wanted to ask a question, why uh, he didn't feel like uh, quantify the problem of the UN? Uh, yeah, we, we, we are not doing questions right now, but uh, oh, that's... No, so, yeah, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that he to do. I just, just my uh, takeaway is why he didn't choose to quantify, challenge the problem of the UN. It will be a nice challenge. That's sure, my takeaway. Short answer is I did quantify and it's in the book. I yes, exactly. you, you need to go to the website, get the book. It is that is like several hundred pages of, of that that material. All right. All next right. up is uh, John, Jeff, and Jean. John, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess my main takeaway is more practical for like my life and work, and that is um, I can work within a particular system and at the same time more efficiently leverage other systems and take account of them without having to become an expert or uh, just whack-a-mole, push a button <laughs> and see what happens. And I think that's tremendously valuable. And so that's something I'm gonna be thinking about and exploring. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank, thank you, John. John. Uh, next up is going to be Sanjay because he's typed, typed exclamation mark followed by Jeff and Jean. Sanjay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Shikant. I Just very quickly. So um, one of the main takeaways that I had, which I found fantastic um, is when, when Tom said that he has a way of quantifying love. So um, I'm definitely going to visit his site and I'm peaked um, and I'm going to watch the TED talk that he has. Um, and also just, just a quick, quick uh, uh, comment that, um, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about sound like technical or engineering problems, but really this can be applied to many areas. Once you, once you understand statistics and the power of that, that's what really what I meant by matrices is not just matrices, but statistics in general. It can be applied to sociological problems. It can be applied to um, political, you know, uh, in almost any human domain. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Right. Next, next up <laughs> is Jeff, Gene, and John R. <clears throat> so Tom, I wanted to tell you that I, that I really heard your emphasis on stakeholders um, as well as on motivation. And I think that that's a, the, um, the stakeholder uh, emphasis, I agree is hugely important. And one that I think that I, I forget to take into account um, uh, because there's so much focus on collaboration and partners and seeing things from different vantage points and, you know, learning the key aspects of everything and, and a focus on, you know, to the point stakeholder interviews regarding any issue is such a way, such a great way to learn so much in, in, a, in a short period of time that the return on that investment is terrific. And so thanks for reminding me of that. I really appreciate it. But next summer, I'm going to write a book on stakeholders just for you, Jeff. <laughs> Remind <laughs> me of it. <laughs> uh, uh, next up is Gene, uh, John, and Rich. Gene, go ahead. 
Yeah, this is quite inspiring because I think we all see a lot of problems around us, education, like politics, and we feel like hopeless or disillusioned. So I think this topic really, you know, this lecture really gave me hope. It just order the book, be the solution. I'm reading another book called Prepared, and the woman actually was, oh, you know, it's, so it's, let's just basically, yeah, very short. <laughs> so basically, yeah. I'm going to learn the system, trying to start, start with small steps to make some change. You know, uh, next me. up, next up is John, Rich, and Quinn. John, go ahead. Yeah, thank you again. It's uh, it's very pleasing and refreshing to uh, have an opportunity to consider things at this level, because in many circumstances, working circumstances or business circumstances. This isn't done very often, but just briefly, let me say that um, in my in my foundation background, my education background, uh, I had a liberal arts degree and with a focus on art and art history and architecture, and uh, and then I went and got a master's degree in architecture and engineering, uh, and and then went on and got a business degree. And the foundational point was uh, a wonderful experience uh, in the process of getting my, my Master of Architecture degree. I worked with a brilliant engineer whose name was Steve Tang. And he had been born in China uh, in the 1920s or 30s and was raised in a wealthy Mandarin family before the revolution and learned uh, Chinese philosophy from his grandfather, homeschooled. All, it was a wealthy family and all of the children were sent to foreign uh, European and American schools. Uh, John, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I want to wrap up. Okay, and, well, the, well, the wrap up, the wrap up is, is I had, I had uh, essentially a private lessons with an engineer who had spent structural engineering with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and was putting philosophical concepts in engineering terms. And it was an amazing experience, and it reminds me of what you are doing. Uh, so I think it's very important, and I'm pleased to hear it. Uh, thank you, John. I mean, what we have found is that people like Buckminster Fuller, Louis Sullivan, see, architects naturally have to think in this way. So they, it's kind of built in. And I think I was watching this um, video by Russell Akoff, whom we are going to cover this Wednesday. And he was making the same point. Um, so that's, that's a very powerful point, John, thanks. Uh, next up is Rich, uh, Gary, and Quinn. Rich, go ahead. Uh, Rich, you need to unmute. Okay, next up is Gary. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Tom and uh, and also Kai, who also has done a lot of great, uh, a lot of great talks on on the on the language and all the other types of uh, things that they have been doing. But also, I just want to take away from this is the use of stepping outside the black box as a systems engineer. That is something that is very valuable to me. Learning how to not be overcome by the things you don't know and the things that you don't know that you don't know. So I just thank Tom for all he does and helping us to get these big problems solved. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Uh, Rich, you're next. Yes, uh, big thank you for Shrinka the host and the Tom the co-host. I'm going to get back to you, Tom, on your website or email and uh, learn more about these engineers. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next thank you. up is Quinn, uh, Deborah, and Mikey. Quinn, go ahead. Hey all, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Um, what I got about uh, out about this talk in particular, um, just kind of reiterating what uh, someone else said, uh, it's just really thinking about, you know, um, whenever you're working on a problem, really taking into account all the stakeholders in the problem, not just your sort of point of view of what they, what you think they may want, but actually, you know, going ahead and speaking with them, really getting a sense for what their needs are. Because um, otherwise you can, you know, run into the issue where you don't have buy-in or, or you're actually not solving the right problem uh, in the first place. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, next up is Deborah, Mikey, Jairo, and Brian. Deborah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. It's been very inspiring because I want to eventually write a book. Many people have said something to me about that, about my ideas. So I'm getting really inspired um, and also confirmed that I'm doing the right thing. So thank you very much. 
Wonderful, Deborah. You know, people are supposed to write one book in two weeks, okay? So we'll, we'll yeah. see your book soon and we'll love to have you a follow up presentation on, on, on the book. So looking forward to it. Uh, Mikey, That's inspiration. <laughs> yes. Mikey, you're next. Uh, Tom, thanks for another dimension of being of teaching me how to think like a planner. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Hiro, uh, followed by Brian. Hiro, what are your brief comments? Uh, the takeaway is the stakeholder and the, um, yeah, breaking things into step and trying to uh, produce value out of each step, yeah, to the stakeholder. And also uh, uh, looking at uh, quantitative uh, or, or coming up with uh, each variable, trying to quanti quantify it. And also the other takeaway is that I got a lot of books to take away that are free. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you, uh, thank you, Hiro. Next up is Brian. Yes, um, I also got a lot of documentation and books um, to take away, so that was very good. Um, I was a little bit surprised that the what I, I gathered was a lack of stakeholder um, focus. Um, 20 years ago, I was working on organizational improvement using something called the European Quality Model. And that was totally based on stakeholder management. So, Wonderful, Brian. Uh, thank you. Uh, Donna, did you have a comment? Okay. Um, Donna, go ahead. I am. Um, so for me, the takeaways are stakeholders and quantification. And I'll just add to the quantification of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. It's important to know what they're measuring for example a lot of stakeholders you know they may get bonuses so they're they're measured by that so they're even though they're saying one thing they're driving towards what they're measured so knowing the measurement is is really key excellent uh thank you thank you donna um so my takeaway from this is that this was an amazing meetup um you know not only that the, the presentation was great but I really like the extent to which and the variety, the, just the range of people who were able to kind of ask questions, give their comments, share their experiences and go back and forth. Uh, I think that was very, very special. So that's, that's what I do this for. So it was amazing. And uh, Tom, what is your takeaway? Uh, <laughs> I didn't see that question coming. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting game, so I'll, 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 you will find me joining you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so Tom, uh, you know, just honored to have you here. And I think your ideas resonate very well with this group because all of us are kind of, you know, they are, most of us are independent thinkers. We are always looking for kind of large problems and different ways of solving it uh, and kind of relentlessly exploring kind of different axes we might have missed. So, so thank you very much for inspiring us and look forward to having you back soon. All right, thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Bye.